So let's give it up for Hutch Madison. Good morning, everybody. If you have a Bible, we'll be opening it to John chapter 10. John chapter 10 is our text for today. And if you're unfamiliar with where that is on your smartphone or your Bible, it's uh, Matthew, then Mark, then Luke, then John. If you get to Acts, you've gone a little bit too far, so back up a little bit. And chapter 10 is where we're going to be today. We're going to look at six words that Jesus said that really set the world on edge. Words mean things. And um, as a guy who has been doing this for... uh, a long time, almost four decades now, I got to be honest with you this morning on the front end that I feel like talking about what we're going to talk about today, words fail me. Wayne Gruden, who wrote the classic systematic theology book that is used in so many seminaries and colleges today, said that what we're about to talk about today is probably the hardest thing for us to wrap our head around. You say, were we going to be talking about the Trinity? No. He said the Trinity is easier to understand than to understand that God came in human flesh. That's what we want to talk about today, because Jesus made a profound and prolific statement. John chapter 10 in verse 30, look at what he said. He said, I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we come into your presence this morning and uh, we feel so inadequate to be able to communicate such a profound truth. So it is with, uh, with utter desperation that we cry out to you that you would give us ears to hear you would give us eyes to see, that we may begin to grasp the profundity wrapped up in the simplicity of these six words. But Father, it will make an eternal difference in every human being's life if we would understand this truth. So speak clearly to us today. Speak simply to us so that we might understand, that we might grow that we might be encouraged and we might be equipped. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There was a man who responded to a help wanted to add at First Baptist Church. It was for a janitorial position. So he went to the church <clears throat> to see about getting the job. He met with the pastor. It, was, uh, it wasn't a large church, but it wasn't a small church either. And so he's meeting with the pastor And after a few minutes of conversation, the pastor handed him some paperwork and asked him to fill it out. Well, the guy sat there for a few moments, and he's just looking at the paperwork, and he's looking at the pastor, and he's thinking to himself, and after a few moments of awkward silence, he tells the pastor, he says, I'm sorry, but I can't read and I can't write. Well, the pastor was disappointed. He he knew that he needed somebody, at least needed to be able to read and write to fulfill this position, so he felt bad for the guy, and, and he got some assistance to help him put together a basket of apples, and he gave him the basket of apples and sent him on his way. Well, this guy eats a couple of those apples, and then he has an idea. He says, I'm going to sell the rest of them. And so he sells those apples, and he makes a little bit of money. He takes that money, and he invests it and buys some more apples, and he sells them. And then he does it again and again and again. Before too long, he had a nice little fruit stand established. Well, over the course of a period of time, several years, this fruit stand explodes into a dynamic, thriving business. And so he decides, you know what, to take this thing to the next level, I'm finally going to have to start a bank account. So he takes $1 million in cash into the local bank and sits down with the banker. And he says, I need to open up an account. Well, the guy sees, the banker sees a $1 million sitting there, and he thinks to himself, this is pretty easy pickings right here. So, so he, uh, after talking for a few minutes, he hands them some paperwork that needs to be filled out in order to start this account. And the guy looks at him, and he just up front honest says, you know what, I'm sorry. I can't read, and I can't write. And so the banker is is absolutely stunned. He says, you mean to tell me you can build a million-dollar business, and you can't read, and you can't write? Where do you think you would be today if you were educated? 
He says, I can tell you exactly where I'd be. I'd be the janitor at First Baptist Church. <laughs> Keep your finger in John chapter 10 and turn with me over to, uh, to chapter 20. And I want you to see a verse in John chapter 20 and uh, verse 31. John tells us the purpose statement for why he wrote this book. John chapter 20, verse 31. But these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of John is a truly amazing book. It's one of four Gospels. The first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are called the Synoptic Gospels. And they're called the Synoptic Gospels because they sort of summarize the story of Jesus from his birth to his death. The book of John, however, is unique. It's unique in several ways. One of the ways in which it is unique is to whom it is written. The, the books of Matthew and Mark were written to Jewish followers of Christ. <clears throat> the book of Luke was written to a guy by the name of Theophilus. But the gospel of John was written to the world. Not only is it unique in who it was written to, but it's also unique in the approach that he takes. Because what the gospel of John does, the, the apostle John takes literally just a few days in the life of Jesus. And he gives us some in-depth look and, 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 and some, some really profound truths that Jesus said and did. And so it's kind of like snapshots, if you will, of the life of Jesus Christ. And what we see in our text today is that throughout this book, and we saw in chapter 20, that the reason why John wrote this book is so that you and I would understand who Jesus is. A lot of times people will say, well, Jesus was a good teacher. He was a beloved prophet. He was a, a wonderful moral man. Well, he was so much more. When you understand that Jesus was God wrapped up in human flesh, it changes absolutely everything. And when we get to where we are in this text, the context of our verse today is really found from verses 22 through 42. And so I want to read a part of that and give you sort of a running commentary to help us understand that Jesus was indeed who he said he was. Did you know that the Old Testament was painting a portrait showing us who the Messiah would be. As a matter of fact, the Old Testament predicted where, Micah 5 and verse 2, when, Daniel 9, 26, how, Isaiah 7, 14, Jesus would enter into the world, that he would be born of a woman, Genesis 3 and verse 15, from the line of Adam's son, Seth, Genesis 4 and verse 26, through Noah's son Shem, Genesis 9, 26 and 27. Through the promised seed of Abraham, Genesis 12 and verse 3. That he would come through the tribe of Judah, Genesis 49 and 10. That he would be the son of David, 2 Samuel chapter 17. Chapter 7, verses 12 and following, that he would die for our sins, Psalm 22, Isaiah 56, Daniel 9, 26, Zechariah 12 and verse 10, that he would rise again from the dead, Psalm 16 and verse 10. All of these supernatural prophecies and many, many others were fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. Never was that said of any other world religious leader except for Jesus. He stands absolutely alone in this. It was predicted that he would come and he came. And look at what he was greeted with when he came, beginning in verse 22. At that time, the feast of dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter. We know this was the Jewish holiday, the Festival of Lights, or Hanukkah. This is probably late November, mid-December, somewhere in that time frame. 
and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So it was a, 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 a porch, a portico, if you will, and he's, he's walking around here just outside of the temple. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, listen to what they said, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Now, what you've got to understand is, is that Jesus has been telling them plainly time and time and time and time again. But they, would, it, they didn't want to hear it. It didn't register. It didn't connect. They didn't have eyes to see. They didn't have ears to hear. And the text goes on. Jesus answered them. Listen to what he said. I told you. I've told you in so many different ways. I have told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe me because you are not a part of my flock. The first portion of John chapter 10 is really all about shepherds and shepherding. And Jesus says, I am the great shepherd. He was using this analogy because it was one that they could resonate with. It was one that they could connect with. And it's interesting I don't know if you realize this or not. I'm not a shepherdologist, but I have a little bit of study behind me in this. Did you know that sheep really do know their shepherd's voice? One of the ways that shepherds would tend their flocks at night is is that they would put the multiple flocks together in what we would consider to be one pen. And what that would allow them to do is to keep the sheep safe, It would allow some social interaction in a very isolated business. The shepherds would be able to talk, compare notes, and be able to share and do life together. But at the dawn of a new day, the way they would separate the flocks is simply one shepherd would call out for his sheep. Here, sheepy, 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 sheepy. (laughs) Ernestine, come on. Jethro, let's go. And almost miraculously, Ernestine and Jethro and the other sheep that belonged to this shepherd would begin to file out of the pen. And none of the others would follow. And then the next shepherd would get up and he would call his sheep. Because a sheep understands that a shepherd feeds them, leads them, and protects them. So they know where their bread is buttered, you know what I'm saying? And so they follow that voice. And Jesus just said this, you're not getting it. You don't understand. You can't see, you can't hear because you are not of my flock. You don't know my voice. You don't know what I'm saying is true. Because elsewhere he said, you are of your father, the devil. my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I want you to picture this with me. You and I are his sheep. We are held in the hand of the Savior, the promised Messiah, God wrapped up in human flesh. And then the Father comes along and wraps his hand around the Son. You are doubly secure. And to take that a step farther, then he comes to our text and he says, I and the Father are one. And you know, when you break that down and you look at it grammatically, it's almost a Star Wars type Yoda moment. Because really the way this text reads is this. I and the Father, one we are. Doesn't that sound Yoda-like? I and the Father, one we are. And that's exactly what this text is saying. But then notice what happens next. Verse 31 the Jews picked up stones to stone him. Why in the world would they do that? 
They did that because they knew exactly what he was saying. He was saying, I am God. And it's interesting there, again, when you grammatically break this text down, it says that they picked up stones. The way that that verbiage is written, it doesn't mean that they went down to the ground to pick up a stone to throw at him. It doesn't mean that they went around the corner to find a stone that was especially good for throwing at people. It carries with it the idea that they brought stones with them. They were carrying them around, waiting for an opportune time to send their ammunition into the flesh of the one who said, I am God. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, it is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. And I wrote in the margin of my Bible, they had it exactly backwards. He being God made himself man. Back in uh, chapter five, Jesus heals a man who for 38 years, the scripture tells us, was lame. And for 38 years, he laid beside this pool That tradition said an angel would come and stir up the waters, and the first person into those waters would get a healing. And for 38 years, because he was unable to move himself into the water, he remained there, unhealed. So Jesus comes by, sees him, and asks him what he wants. And he says, well, I want to be healed, but I don't have anybody to help me get into the water when the water is stirred. And Jesus says something very interesting to him. Jesus says to him, I'll tell you what, I want you to just pick up your mat and walk. Now, what is interesting to me is is this. Jesus, when he was 12 years old, I don't know if you realize this or not, but think about this with me for a second, because I think this is pretty cool. Jesus, when he was 12 years old, went with his family down to Jerusalem for a religious celebration and feast. As he and his family and his friends were heading back home a day into the three-day journey, Mary and Joseph realized Jesus is missing. They go back to Jerusalem, and lo and behold, where do they find him? He's sitting with the, the, the temple leadership, having a theological discussion. He's 12 years old. I wonder if when Jesus was 12, he walked by made eye contact with that same guy because for 38 years he waited by the water's edge and now Jesus says take up your mat and walk and that is such an amazing miracle when I was in uh, eighth grade I messed up my knee playing basketball and I wore a cast And I remember getting that cast off, and it felt really weird. If you've ever had a cast, you know what I'm saying. What happens is the muscles begin to atrophy. And I could stand in front of a mirror, and I could see a significant difference between my left leg that had had a cast on it and my right leg that didn't. But here is a guy who never took a step. And Jesus says, not only do I want you to get up, but I want you to take up your mat, and I want you to walk home. but he did it on a Sabbath day. And so when the religious leaders saw what this guy was doing, he said, it's not lawful for you to carry your mat on the Sabbath day. He said, listen, I don't know about what you're talking about. All I know is there was a guy who said, get up, take up your mat. And I've been laying there for 38 years, so I did what he said. (laughs) And when you read this text, it was because that Jesus healed this man on the Sabbath, they wanted to kill him. Go over to chapter 8. And in chapter 8, Jesus makes this claim. He says, before Abraham was, I am. And again, the religious crowd knew what he was saying. 
He says, I am God because before Abraham was, I was there too. So they picked up stones to kill him. So this was a habit of what they were trying to do. But then when you finish the rest, rest of our text, Jesus takes them to a theological discussion, which is always a great thing to do with theologically minded people. You know, when I was ordained, someone gave me a bit of advice that proved to be very profitable. He said, listen, if you get into a hard, sticky theological question that you really don't know the answer to, you throw it back on the people who are asking the question and watch them go at it. And I'll be honest with you, I did that. <laughs> because people love to discuss among themselves, and that's exactly what he does. He takes them back to Psalm 82, and he gets them into a discussion, and then it says that he slipped away. He went to the other side of Jordan, the Jordan River, where John the Baptist was doing ministry. And look at what it says at the end of this verse, verse 42. And many believed him there. In Jerusalem, the religious crowd picking up stones to throw at him. It wasn't his time. It wasn't the way that prophecy said he would die. But when he got away from the religious crowd, people's hearts and lives were changed because they saw him for who he really is. God wrapped up in human flesh. Jesus proclaimed that he was God in two ways, his words and his works. His words and his works. He proclaimed, I am God. I and the Father are one. And he made that statement by the things he said, and he backed it up by the things he did. When you read the Gospel of John, you see a word that is, is uniquely his. You see the word signs. Signs was John's way of communicating to us, Jesus did the miraculous. And the only way he could do the miraculous is because he was miraculous. God wrapped up in human flesh. It's hard to wrap our head around it. But when you understand that's biblical truth, it changes everything. And it sets the table for our discussion around the tables. Listen, guys, there are no softballs in today's Q&A. But I'm going to pray for and have prayed for you, and I've prayed for every table leader, that as we break to the tables today, God would give us fresh insight, real understanding, and that he would help us to begin to wrap our head around the miracle of the Messiah. Jesus, God, enveloped in human flesh. Let's go to the tables. Imagine with me, if you will, it's a Saturday morning. Let's say it's a Saturday morning in January. It's kind of an Indian summer, so it's a fairly nice day. You're looking forward to getting some things accomplished, but it's also kind of a lazy day because you've been really busy. You're, uh, maybe you're reading the paper, you're going through some email, or maybe you're watching the news. The breakfast table is still there. The, the pots and pans have not been cleaned. You're just kind of chilling out. And the doorbell rings. 
It's late in the morning. You're thinking to yourself, yeah, I guess I can show up at the door like this. And lo and behold, standing on the other side of the door when you open it, is a couple of people who you almost instinctively know as soon as you see them that they are with a particular religious sect that you disagree with. And you know that because they have sort of a satchel that's got some pamphlets in it, a little magazine, and they engage you in a discussion. They're very kind, very nice. You thought you saw a car driving through the neighborhood and some people getting out and starting walking. You think to yourself, you know, we got a sign out at the front of the neighborhood that says no soliciting, but they come in anyway. And they start to engage you in a conversation. You think to yourself, eh, what the heck, I got some time. Come on in. And so you listen to the spiel. And they say things like, you know, I can take your King James Bible and I can show you that Jesus was not the Son of God. That he was just a created being, the first in a long line of created beings. How would you engage that conversation with those well-meaning people at your door? That's why it's so important. That's why we want to fulfill the mission of one thing for men, which is to spur men on to a passionate walk with God. So that you'd be able to make a sound argument. Guys, you and I were born with an inherent disease called sin. And that sin separates you and me from a holy God. The only way for the bridge, for the gap to be bridged was to do what Jesus did. Because if a good man were to die for sins, it would be for their sins alone. But on your very best day, your very best three seconds of life, it wouldn't be good enough to match up to God's holiness. And so God said, I love mankind so much. I'm going to send my son to be born of a virgin. And we just came through the Christmas season. And we know that when Mary explained to Joseph that she was pregnant and he was ready to put her away, and the angel said, no, that which is conceived is of the Holy Spirit, and you're to name him Jesus. Because he will save his people from their sin. And the Holy Spirit came upon her. And Joseph didn't know her sexually until after Jesus had been born. And Jesus lived a perfect and sinless life. And scripture tells us that he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so the only way that this gap could be bridged was for the absolute holy perfection of God himself to bridge that gap and he did that through the person of Jesus Christ. And whatever religious system says, you've got to earn it, you've got to work for it, you've got to strive for it, is a false religion. No other world religious leader ever said the words that Jesus said, I am God. But Jesus said, I am God. I and the Father are one. And I am the only one who can bridge the gap between holy God and sinful man, 
because in his absolute sinless perfection, when his blood was shed, it meant that it was atoning for all of the sin of all men, women, teenagers, boys and girls in all of human history. It's all about what Jesus did for you and for me and for the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him should not perish but could have eternal life. If you are under the sound of my voice today, and you have never accepted Jesus as your real and personal Savior, let me say this as simply as I can. It's as simple as ABC. A, admit, I messed up. I've blown it. I am a sinner, and my sin has separated me from God. B, believe that Jesus was who he said he was, and he did what he said he came to do. And he proved it with an exclamation point and an exclamation point and another exclamation point when he rose from the grave. Do you realize that all the Jewish religious leaders had to do to squelch Christianity was three or four days after Jesus' burial was to produce a body? And here we are 2,000 years later and nobody has been able to produce a body Jesus said, I am God and I'm going to prove it to you because I'm going to rise from the dead. No one takes my life from me. I lay it down and I can take it up again and I will and he did. And see, confess Jesus as your Savior and Lord. Admit, believe, confess. We have a tendency to muck things up and make it so difficult. One day, some little children were brought to Jesus and the disciples did what they thought they were supposed to do. Hey, 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 like most Baptist churches, you know, hey, 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 get away, get away, get away, get away, get away, get away, give them some space, give them some breathing room. Jesus said, oh, wait a second, fellas, you don't understand. The kingdom of heaven is just like this. Not childish, but childlike. Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? With every head bowed and every eye closed. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your real and personal Savior, in the privacy of this moment, just between you and God, would you pray a prayer something like this? This is not a magical prayer. But if this prayer expresses a sincere desire of your heart, I want you to know that all heaven rejoices because today you come to faith in Christ. Would you say, dear Jesus, I realize that I'm a sinner and that my sin has separated me from you. I don't understand it all, but as best as I know how, right now I confess, I believe you are who you say you are and that you did what you said you would do. Because you rose from the grave, because you died on the cross, I invite you to come into my heart and into my life to be my Savior and my Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing and answering my prayer. Father, for everyone who has prayed that prayer or something similar to it today, I pray that you would seal that decision as you promised you would do. I pray that you would help us today to understand that all of heaven rejoices whenever one sinner repents of their sin and comes to faith in Christ. Father, I thank you that you sent your one and only son, the perfect perfect son of God, God of very God. And although it's hard for us to wrap our head around, we understand that because of what you said and because of what you did, you are worthy of all of our worship, worthy of all of our praise, and worthy of all of our life. We give it to you today. Thank you, Jesus. Help me now to follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. It's been a privilege to be with you. Next week, we'll be back studying the Word again. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.
One Thing for Men meets at Cabernet Steakhouse in Alpharetta, Georgia on Friday mornings from 7 to 8 a.m. If you live in the Atlanta area or visit the area on Friday, we would love to have you join us in person. And if you have been blessed by this message, please consider supporting One Thing for Men online.